So welcome to the fourth and final for now session of The Snake in the Garden with Rabbi David Silber. We are, of course, looking at narratives that are connected to the original narratives in Genesis of The Snake in the Garden. We will be stopping for now. Um, whether or not we pick up again with this same class, the same theme in the spring has yet to be determined, but there will be plenty of classes. Don't worry about that. If you're joining us here on Zoom, we love to see your face on camera, but if it's not a period when we're encouraging questions, discussion, uh, please do keep your microphone off just to minimize background noise. Life happens <laughs> and it uh, can become a little distracting and cause the sound to jump around a bit on the recording. Um, you are, of course, always welcome to use the chat. And if you're joining us on Facebook, feel free to put questions and comments in the comment section right below the video. If you're joining us on Drisha Live, hi, good evening. We're glad that you're learning with us. I will be sharing the text that we're using on screen for your convenience and putting links into the chat. But of course, you are welcome to check out the text in your own beloved Tanakh. Without further ado, Rabbi Silver. Uh, thank you. Okay, so um, we um, began with the story of the Nachash, the snake in the garden, and um, different possible explanations of what motivates the snake. Uh, it's not clear the snake needs too much too much motivation to begin with, but assuming there is a particular a motive involved. So my the suggestion I was pushing is that the snake is upset that God has favored uh, one of his one of God's creations over over everything else, including the snake, and that is the human being. God has a special place called Gan Eden, where uh, God's intention is to be in contact with one might say a shared sacred space. And the snake doesn't like that because after all, the human may be special, but the snake is certainly special. It is the most clever of all God's creations. So the snake sets out to disrupt God's plan. That was the particular interpretation I was pushing. And um, at the end of the day, the snake succeeds. So the snake's idea is essentially to prevent God from realizing God's plan, which is that the human and God share a space. Now, in, in thinking about that way to understand the Nachash, the one who comes to mind immediately, clearly when one looks at the Tanakh, the Bible in general, the Torah specifically, um, is of course Amalek. Because Amalek, if we actually look at the first real narrative about Amalek, that appears in the second half of chapter 17 of Shemot. And um, the story that precedes Amalek is Israel's complaints, quarrels with God, there it's a quarrel about water, and doubts about whether God is truly in their midst or not. Verse number seven is very critical. The people quarreled and they said, Masom Riva. And they said at the end of the seventh verse, Hayesh Hashem is God present amongst us or not? And the very next words in the Torah are, Vayavo Amalek. Amalek came and fought against Israel in Rafidim. Now, leaving aside now the immediate context of Amalek's entrance into the biblical narrative, uh, what's interesting is, this is chapter 17 of Exodus. So Israel has crossed the sea in chapter 15. The journey has begun. The man has come down from heaven. Uh, the, some instruction about Shabbat has been given. They've twice been given water in the desert. And this is the end of chapter 17. Chapter 18, actually, uh, is about Yitro, Moshe's father, who are coming to visit him and giving suggestions about how to set up a system of justice. Chapter 19 already are the preparations for receiving the Torah. Chapter 20 is the Ten Commandments. And following upon chapter 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 are additional commandments, at which point Moshe goes back up the mountain 
at the end of chapter 24, to bring down the tablets, the Luchot. Uh, and then, of course, the Luchot and the instructions that Moshe received on the mountain to build the Mishkan. So had everything gone according to plan, that is to say, had there been no golden calf, and if one simply reads the Torah as the Torah presents it, presuming that it's more or less in chronological order, as most of the commentaries assume, not Rashi, but everybody else, then fundamentally what lies ahead for Israel, having left Mitzrayim, is two, are two things. Number one, receiving the Torah, and number two, building the Mishkan, building God's, I might say God's house in the middle of the camp. Uh, the ark is at the center and representing God's dwelling place. So what we have in the Mishkan, essentially, is a kind of recreation of, of the Garden of Eden. It's different in some respects, but it's fundamentally a recreation of Eden. That's the end of the book of Exodus. And it's not, a, it's not surprising, one might say, that if one looks at the Mishkan, the language of the Mishkan, which occupies about 12 chapters of 40 in the book of Shemot, one will find consistently language which is parallel to, one might even say drawn from, the creation narratives of the beginning of the Torah. It's not a surprise, because after all, what is the Mishkan, if not, a kind of Garden of Eden, a kind of shared space where God and the human share the space. And not only do they share a space, but of course the Mishkan is the place from which God speaks. So the two great events at the end of the book of Shemot, which is also called the book of redemption, the two great events are of course receiving the Torah and the Mishkan. The, the, the relative weight we give to those two events which is, which is primary, which is secondary, is a great and very important dispute between, among others, Rashi on one hand and the Rabban, probably the two greatest medieval commentaries that we have. Rashi feels that the highlight is actually receiving the Torah. And the Rabban feels no, receiving the, receiving the Torah was preliminary to the Mishkan. And I would say that looking at the Torah simply looking at it from what it seems to say, the most plausible reading, I would have to say that certainly the Ramban is right. That's how the book ends. The ultimate goal, as the Ramban says, was to dwell in God's presence. Holy people who have a holy, holy house, a holy abode in their midst. But in any event, whatever weight we give to these two events, the receiving of the Torah at Sinai and or the building of the Mishkan, which is the concluding, two great concluding events of this book, that's what we left Egypt for. We left Mitzrayim not just to be freed from bondage, <clears throat> but to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. The tablets, after all, are called Shnei Chotabrit, the tablets of the covenant, and they're housed in the ark, which is the central vessel of the Mishkan, from which God speaks. So if we look at it from this perspective, what is, what is Amalek doing here in chapter 17? What Amalek is doing, essentially, is trying to prevent you, you being, in this case, Israel, trying to prevent Israel from, from achieving their full potential, from arriving at their destination. That's what Amalek is about. And by the way, as I'm talking, as is often the case, I'm reminding myself that in the episode, not of the golden calf, but the episode of the spies, as is detailed in chapter 14 of um, the book of Bamidbar, 13 and 14, that the Israelites decide to fight anyway. Moshe says, don't try to fight now against the Canaan, you won't succeed, God's not in your midst. They fight anyway. And there it says, and the Canaanites and the Amalekites defeated them. So once again, Amalek functions in that story as well, in the so-called spy episode. It's Amalek that sort of the final nail in the coffin in preventing Israel from reaching their, their goal. And their goal was, as God stated explicitly, to leave Egypt 
but to come to a different land, a good land, a broad land, a covenantal land, the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, etc., etc., the land of your sojournings, the land that I swore to give to you, it's a sacred land. What is Amalek? Amalek is there to prevent you from arriving at the place that you should, in fact, uh, arrive at, that you hope to arrive at. So chapter 17, by Yavro Amalek, is very, is, is, is very, uh, is, is positioned in a very important space. It's just before Martin Tola and the Mishkan. Now, the truth of the matter is that at the end of the day, the book of Exodus has a very happy ending because we do succeed in building the Mishkan despite the golden calf, but it's not so simple as we know. Not so simple at all. In any event, so Amalek is similar to the, is basically, I would say, a, a, a representation of the Nachash, not just because the Am Amalek is God's enemy, as is the Nachash, not just because Amalek is the human enemy, as is the Nachash, not because it's the eternal enemy, as it were, as is the Nachash, not only because Amalek attacks you at the weakest point, as does the snake, all that is true, but above all of that, all of those truths is a different truth, which is we, one can see Amalek as that which is, tries to prevent you from arriving at your hoped for destination. Okay, so let me, um, let me begin now with referencing another story in which uh, I think Amalek uh, functions, even though the name, Am not, not Amalek, the snake, the Nafash, the, 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 what the Nachash represents and what functions in the narrative. I did want to come back to a comment that was made last week um, about the stories in the book of Bamidbar. Of course, there we have, of course, the famous bronze serpent, the Nechash HaNechoshet, which is interesting. I'm not sure we're going to get to that this evening, the Nechash HaNechoshet, which is quite interesting. But the Nechash HaNechoshet, actually, as we saw last week, that's the story where Israel, by Israel I mean the second generation, those that grew up in the desert, they were never in Egypt. They complain that why are we meandering along? Let's just get into the land. For this, we didn't have to leave Mitzrayim. Not that they were ever in Mitzrayim, but for this, we didn't have to leave Mitzrayim. We could have simply stayed there because we're just walking in the desert. And they says they spoke against God and against Moshe and God sends the snakes to get to bite them, to get them. And the people go back to Moshe, pray for us, remove the snakes. And interestingly, as we noted last week, God does not remove the snakes, but God gives Israel a way to overcome the snake. And that is by constructing a nechash ha the bronze nechash, the bronze serpent. When you look at it, you would be healed. The snakes are there. They're not removed, but you can be healed. But the manner of healing is very interesting. You're healed from the nachash by, by, by looking at the nachash ha-nachoshet. That's something very interesting. We have to park that for now, but then sometime in the future, we'd like us to think collectively about that. That's chapter 20, uh, 20, 21. And then after the battle of Sichon and Og, where Israel begins to capture the land, there we have the story of Bilam. And the story of Bilam of course, is the story where Bilam is hired by the king of Moab, by Balak, to curse Israel, to curse Israel. And we're not going to get into that story right now. It's a, a central story in the, in the Chumash, but God does not allow Bilam to curse Israel, quite the opposite. He who set forth to curse is forced to bless. Actually, on three and then a fourth occasion, that's the parasha of Balak. That's the story of Bilam. God forces Bilam, who came to curse, to utter a blessing. And the significance of that, of course, is what the Torah has done in the Bilam story, of course, is, to, uh, is, to, is really to ask a question. Because the story of Bilam, which is chapter 22, comes right after chapter 21, right after Israel has begun to capture the land of Canaan. The first conquest was on the other side of the Jordan, Sichon and Og, and now the Torah asks the question. 
Torah asked an unstated question, but it's a question, which is by virtue of what does Israel, that is to say the generation that was born in the desert, the second generation, by virtue of what are they be successful as they begin to conquer the land? After all, the first generation wandered in the desert for 40 years. They were not allowed to move forward. They made one attempt and were defeated. And yet suddenly, generation number two in chapter 21 has defeated Sichar and O. So the Torah raises the question, by virtue of what are they worthy? And it raises this question through the uh, entrance of Bilam, who comes to curse. That is to say, through his through speech, the snake-like speech of what Bilam intends to do is to bring down a curse upon Israel. If in fact they're worthy of being cursed, the curse will, will take effect and presumably Israel will not be able to capture the land. But for whatever reason, that doesn't work. And the story of Bilam is that God forces Bilam to bless. As God said, Lo ta'aret am ki baruchu, probably means you, not that you shouldn't curse them because they are blessed, but more you cannot curse them because they are in fact are blessed. What the Torah does not explain is by virtue of what generation number two is more worthy than generation number one. That's a very important question. We'll have to park that one as well. But my point is, this is relevant to our, to our study of this evening. I'll come back to this later. Now let me come to another story where the Nachash is not mentioned by name, but the Nachash presumably figures prominently in the story. That is the Nachash-like qualities figure prominently in the story. And here we come to a story, just by coincidence, it's the uh, Parsha. And by coincidence, uh, having to be teaching this general subject on Sunday mornings, haven't gotten there yet to this particular story. But the subject of this week's Parsha is of course Yaakov. And Yaakov, as described early on, in chapter 25 and chapter 27 of Breshit, Yaakov is a, first of all, upon his birth, his name is Yaakov. His name is Yaakov because upon the birth of himself and his twin brother, he's grabbing onto the heel of his brother. Yodo ochezet vakev esav. Yaakov is grabbing onto the heel of his brother, presumably to prevent him from coming out first. Yaakov wants the, the fighting, which one should be the firstborn. And in point of fact, Yaakov later uh, purchases the rights of the firstborn, whatever they may be, uh, from his brother. The Torah says in chapter 25 that Esau came back from the field. That's in chapter 25 of Reshit. And by Yazid Yaakov Nazid, Jacob was cooking up a meal by Yazid Yaakov Nazid, the cooking up lentil, a lentil soup of some sort. Esau comes from the field and he's tired in chapter 25, towards the end of 25. And Esau says to Yaakov, pour that red stuff down my throat. I'm tired. And presumably tired means also hungry. Famished, they translate. That's why they call them Edom, the red stuff. He's also red complexion. Says Jacob, sell me your birthright. Kayom et Sell me the birthright now. Says Esav, what's the point? I'm at the, I'm at the point of death. Either he means, I could die now, I'm dying of hunger, an exaggeration. Or he means, since I'm a hunter and I have a dangerous profession, I could die at any time. I'm worried about birthrights. Birthrights are for the future. I live in the present. Who, who needs a birthright? Not important to me. At which point Yaakov says, really? Then swear you will, swear you will give it to me. In the next verse, he shovel me, Kayom. Swear. Take an oath. And Esau swears. And Esau sold the birthright to Yaakov. Now the Torah says Esau, in the next verse, Esau ate and he drank. Yaakov notanu Yesov lechem, he gave him some bread, also he threw in some bread as well. So, you know, 
it's on the house, the bread. He ate and drank, he got up and he left. So did the Esav spurn or degrade the birthright. So the question, of course, is the Torah presents Esav in a negative fashion here. Someone who lives in the moment, someone who will sell his birthright for a bowl of soup. Vayivez is a negative term. But our interest is less on Esav and more on Yaakov. And that is, what do you make of Yaakov's behavior over here? Is Yaakov acting, is, it, is Yaakov kind of innocent? Or is this all a scheme constructed by Yaakov? And I think it's pretty safe to say, given the language of the Chumash, that Yaakov is a schemer. And the key to, the key to it is, of course, the expression, the words, Vayozed Yaakov Nazid, Vayozed. Vayozed is a verbal form of Nazid, which means lentil. But of course, anybody familiar at all with biblical Hebrew understands that the word Lohazid, for example, Vichiyazidish Ariyehu Hargobi Arma, or the word that appears over and over again in the, in the Talmud, Mezid, as opposed to Shogeg. Shogeg is by accident, and Mezid is intentional. By Yosef Yaakov Nazid, um, Jacob, when I, we, we, we have the same expression in, in, in English. He cooked up a scheme. That's it. He cooked up a scheme. It's not an accident. He knows exactly when his brother comes back. He knows Esau's nature, and he knows he's tired. And he takes advantage of the tiredness of Esau and takes advantage of Esau's living in the moment to acquire a birthright, I would add, and this is, doesn't put Jacob in a very good light in my view, that he also makes him swear. When you swear, you say something in God's name, you can't, you, you can't ever revoke it. The Chumash doesn't tell us why Yaakov wants the birthright, but Esau has a suggestion as to why Yaakov later, Esau makes a suggestion in retrospect why Yaakov wanted that birthright, that Bechorah, because later, uh, when Yitzchak says to Esau in chapter 27, I'm, I'm very old, I, I, I might die soon, let me bless you before I die, and Rivka overhears it. So Rivka says to Yaakov to go and to take, quickly go in before your father and take the blessing that was destined for Esau, in Yitzchak's opinion, and Yaakov objects, maybe he'll catch me, and she dresses him up, he's dressed as Esau, and and uh, he stands before his father, his mother has, has prepared the food, and uh, Yitzchak says, who are you? Because this came back too quickly. Anochi bincha b'cholcha Esav. I am your oldest son, I'm, right? I'm, I'm your oldest son, I'm, I'm the b'chor. In other words, the point of I'm the b'chor, Esav, is what Yaakov is saying is, or what Esav understands Yaakov to be, to be doing here is, that the taking of the birthright, whatever privilege, privileges it may or may not give you, but from Esau's perspective later, when he finds out, he says, did he call himself Yaakov? By Yaakovini Zepamai, and he circum circumvented me twice. At Bechorati Lokach, he took my birthright. And now he took my blessing. So the point is, what Esau understands is, now I know why Yaakov was the Bechorah. He's already thinking about the bracha. Whether that's true or not, I can't say, but that's Esau's understanding. And certainly, the Chumash does suggest a connection between the two. First of all, because the word Bechorah and Bracha have exactly the same letters. And uh, because in each of those two cases, we have Yaakov taking advantage of somebody. In the first instance, it's about Esau being tired. And in the second instance, it's about his father being blind. He takes advantage of his father's blindness to stand before his father and to lie to his face, actually, to make a claim. As, as, as Isaac said, your, your brother came in stealth with deceit and he took your blessing. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole question of the blessing now. And that's a whole other question. But here's the point that I would make about Yaakov. His name is Yaakov. Let's start with that. And Asa makes a point. And he's, upon birth, he's holding on to the heel of his brother. 
well, holding on to the heel and acting in deceit and speaking untruths, well, fit, that's the perfect description of the main character of the Garden of Eden story. Probably the main character, the one that makes it interesting, and that is Mr. Snake, the Nachash. So what we have before us is a Nachash. And as I commented, I think in a different class, what's interesting is that the reader knows it can't be Asa. Asa's married Canaanite women. Asa's out of the question. But the question that the Chumash asks us, or wants us to ask, is it can't be Asa, but can it be Yaakov? Does such a person deserve not just a blessing, but the covenantal blessing? And that's the question that the Chumash wants us to ask. And now the question is, what is the answer the Torah provides for us? When I say provides for us, I mean, when we look at the Torah and read what it appears to be saying, not what we would want it to say, that would be disrespectful. It's, we actually make an attempt to see what the Torah is actually saying. And here we come to an interesting story, which is probably, if you had to pick one story, that's the core story that represents, I think, a core belief that the Torah puts forward, a core understanding of the human being that the Torah puts forward. If I had to pick one story, it's got to be from, in my way of thinking, the story of Jacob wrestling with this angel. So I want to pay attention to the story over here and uh, try to understand what's going on. The story is that Yaakov, after 20 years in the house of Ravan, returns home. And upon returning home, uh, he uh, sends messengers to his brother Esau. Remember that Esau, upon understanding that Yaakov has taken his blessing, not to speak of the birthright, is determined to kill it, to, to kill Yaakov. And that's why Yaakov, one of the reasons Yaakov is sent away, he's sent away to his mother's brother's house to find the wife, but firstly to escape the wrath of Asa, who threatens to kill him. Asa, of course, is among other things, a uh, Yodea Tzayed. He is a, uh, a uh, hunter. So, Yaakov, upon returning, sends messengers to Esau. And the messengers tell Yaakov that Esau is coming towards you with 400 men. And Yaakov doesn't know what to make of this. Um, he is very worried. The reader doesn't know what to make of it either. We don't know why Esau is coming with 400 men towards Yaakov. Is he coming to kill Yaakov? Is he coming to greet Yaakov? Is he just coincidentally passing by Yaakov? The reader, that's us, we have no idea. And you can't know, actually. But we know one thing, that Yaakov uh, assumes the worst. Or he, at least he assumes that potentially, potentially it could be very bad. And he he's thinking that maybe Esau comes not just to kill him, but to kill him and all his people. So he does three different things upon hearing that Asim is coming towards him with 400 men. One is he divides his, his people into two parts. He says, maybe if Asim kills one of them, the other ones will escape. So I'll be able to save some of the, some of the people. That's the first thing he does. Then in verse 10, he does something else, which is he prays. Asim prays, uh, Yaakov prays, and he calls out to the God of Abraham and the God of Yitzhak. Um, he says, you know, I am unworthy. He says, first, you told me to come home. And we're not studying the Yaakov story now at all. I mean, this is, every piece of this is interesting. You told me to come home. You made promises to me. I know I'm not worthy. Katonti, I'm unworthy of all the kindnesses. I left with nothing. Now I have so much. And verse number 12, critical verse for us, save me from my brother from Asa. I'm afraid of him. Lest he come and kill me, mother and child alike. He'll kill all of us, a massacre. So Yaakov has divided his people into two groups and Yaakov then turns to God and prays. And then he does a third thing beginning in verse number 14. He takes these animals 
which he had uh, gained in the house of Ravan through, through further manipulations, but, but he has them. And he sends many, many gifts to his brother Esau. So with three different things, he takes some precautions to save some of them. He prays and he sends gifts. Now what interests us right now is the prayer. It's a prayer. It's a very direct prayer. It's about as basic as you can get. We had to reduce it to two words. I would say the two words are, Hatsi save me. Hatsi Leinina, deliver me, they say, save me for my brother. And you know, in the book, in the Torah, when people address God in prayer, always, God responds. God always answers, except here. God doesn't say anything. And what's more basic than this prayer? He's going to kill me and kill my children, kill my wives. Save me. And after all, you told me to come back. You know? And you made all kinds of promises. But my brother is going to eliminate that in one fell swoop. And what does God say? Nothing. Nothing. And you, right? Nothing. And the next verse, verse 14, are the gifts. Fine. Now, if we scroll down some more. Meanwhile, no answer. And the, the um, he, he's sending these gifts. The Torah describes the gifts. He instructs his messengers what to say. He says, for example, just go back for one second. He say the following thing. He says that Yaakov is going to come after us after you see the gifts. For he said, Achapra panav bamincha ha'lechet lefanai. Achapra panav. L'chapeh means to atone. Here they translate, I will propitiate with him. For with the, with the gifts that come before me, the mincha, which is also a sacrificial term, afterwards I will see his face. Ulai yisa panai. Perhaps he will forgive me. So what Yaakov is asking for over here, the language, the words of verse number 21 are all words of forgiveness. L'chapeh, l'rot panim, term that appears later, and the pilgrimages to God's space, and Yisopanai to forgive. So I'm fine, he sends the gifts. That's in verse 21, we scroll down, and then we see the following, that that, right, Yaakov remains in the camp. That same night, he takes all of his family, and he crosses the fort of the Yabok. But verse number 25, all of them, the 11 children, it says, the, the, those are the sons, and he takes the wives, and he brings them across the river, across the Yabok, crossing the water, crossing the Yabok means going, entering into the, into the promised land. And lo and behold, in verse number 25, by Yaakov Vivado, Jacob was left alone. Why is Jacob still on this side of the Yabok is a good question. That's a question. For whatever reason, he brings them across, but he himself does not cross over. And a, a man, an ish, wrestled. The word is an interesting word. Because the word, the, 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 the word that appears in is Aleph Bet Kuf. What is Aleph Bet Kuf? Avak. What is Avak? Avak is synonymous in the Bible with the word Afar, with, with, with dust dirt or dust. So Jacob, the Ramban says, because when you're fighting, you get down in the dust and you're rolling around the, 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 on the ground and you get all dirty. So Jacob can't cross the river. What is the river called? Ma'avaya Bok. He can't cross Ma'avaya. Everybody else can cross. But Jacob can't cross Ma'avaya Bok until Vaye Ovek. And there is somebody here, an ish, a mysterious ish, who is stopping him from crossing over. The ish is here to make sure that Jacob never crosses over to the other side. That's the function of the ish. He wrestles with Jacob until the dawn. Adalot hashacha. Now it's interesting. Clearly, it's a story centered from the language. It's a kind of mythic prose over here. It's bigger than like this it's a great mystery. Everybody else can cross to the other side, except for Jacob, the children, the wives. Why is it that Jacob cannot cross? Everybody else can cross. And of course, the answer is because their crossing has one meaning. 
But for Jacob to cross to the other side is very different because Jacob has been told by God when Jacob had his dream that he will be covenantal. He will, he will be in, in line with Abraham and Yitzhak and then there's Yaakov. And his descendants will follow suit. But for Jacob to be covenantal, he has to cross into the land. But apparently, if Jacob remains Jacob, he can't cross into the land. Jacob, qua Jacob, will never cross into the land. That's what the Torah is saying. If he stays the old Jacob, with the snake-like qualities, with the one whose blessings is always taken from somebody else, whether it's ace of a lover, whether it's dece deception, that doesn't qualify you for the covenantal blessing. It doesn't mean you're the worst guy who ever lived, but it doesn't qualify you for the covenantal blessing. The other people have no issues. You know, but for Jacob, the crossing over has a different significance than it does for anybody else. So the ish, the function of this ish is to prevent him from reaching his destination. I would call that a, 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 a nachash like quality, which of course is why you have a yeh of eight. Because what did God say to the snake? Afar tochal ko chayecha. You eat dust all the days of your life. Afar representing death. You're a death in life. That's the snake. And the snake wants to make sure that Yaakov never gets to the destination. However, when this mysterious ish saw, he could not prevail. He wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket. doesn't often mean just to touch, it means to injure. In Jacob's wrestling, the socket of his hip was strained or moved from its place. So Jacob is wounded, but Jacob is alive. And now we have the continuation. This mysterious ish says, Vayomer shalcheni ki hashachar, strange verse. Send me away for the dawn has come. That itself points to great mystery. There's more here than we're reading. Vayomer lo hashalechacha ki embe rachtani, no, says Jacob, I demand a blessing. I want you to bless me. Vayomer elov mashimecha, what is your name? Vayomer Yaakov, Jacob. Vayomer lo Yaakov yeomer od shimcha. No longer are you to be called Jacob. Ki im Yisrael, but rather Israel, Yisrael. Ki sarito im Elohim, ki im anoshim vatuchal. Your name is no, not Jacob, but rather Israel. For you have striven with human and divine, with human and divine beings, vatuchal, and you have prevailed. What's interesting is, just parenthetically, the Torah never said that Jacob actually prevailed. The Torah said earlier that the other guy did not prevail. Sometimes, the, sometimes not being overcome by adversity is itself success. So this is your blessing. Give me a blessing. Notice he demands a blessing directly, not through somebody else, but directly. And what is the blessing? The blessing is that you, I, that you can see, you see yourself as somebody different, not only Jacob. And it's interesting, he's always called Jacob. Yaakov remains Yaakov throughout the Chumash, unlike Avram, it's never Avram, it's Avraham. The name Avram is lost. Sarai is Sarah. It's not Sarai anymore. With Yaakov, that's not true. Yaakov is always Yaakov. He's an addition, he's Israel. Now, the Ramban has pointed out something very interesting here, which is that Yaakov and Yisrael actually are opposites. Because Yaakov needs to go around. The Ramban points out, I mentioned this in another of my classes, that the ache of the heel, if you look at a newborn baby, you'll see the heel is actually round. The heel is round. Yisrael, says the Ramban, it's, we, we read it Yisrael, but Yud, Sin, or Shin, Reish, Aleph, Lamed, can equally be read Yashar, El, God is Yashar. And Akov and Yashar, Yashar is direct. Akov is circuitous. The verse in Amos, Boyahe Akov Lemishar, often translated as the crooked shall become straight. The circuitous shall become direct, is the literal translation. So you become 
the name that I give you is exactly the opposite of what you've been till now. Because you have striven and you have prevailed. And actually, it's as Yisrael that Jacob will cross to the other side. If he remains over Yaakov, he never crosses to the other side. If we just read a few more lines over here, and then I want to get to the point I wanted to make. So Yaakov says, what's your name? Yaakov still doesn't fully understand. And the answer is, don't ask me my name. Rashi says, I don't have a name. I have a, I have a mission. Angels don't have names. They also have names, but primarily they have missions. I'm God's messenger. I'm Malach is a messenger. Don't ask me my name. And he blessed him there. And then Jacob names the place. He named the place in chapter 20. He names this place by Yaakov, Shem HaMakom Peniel. He named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. Ki ra'iti Elohim panim al panim batinat tzel nafshi. I have seen God face to face. And yet, batinat tzel nafshi, my life has been preserved. Now here, just to reflect upon this story, and the story has so much in it, let me make, let me make first one point about Jacob naming the place Peniel. And that is, there's something about the story that is very, very, I would say from a Jewish perspective, there's a reason this story I believe is, is the, you have to pick one story, we don't have to. This is a story of enormous significance. First of all, it's when, it's when Israel was born. Jacob becomes Israel. But there's something else about the story. And that is, we noticed earlier that when Jacob prayed to God, his prayer was, save me, and God did not respond. The only place that God actually does not respond to someone's prayers. So did God, how do we interpret God's silence is the question. And here, verse number 31, is the way to understand in this particular case, God's silence, in this particular case, so when Yaakov says, I have seen God face to face, but my soul has been preserved or saved. In other words, Yaakov had requested that God save, save me. And God's response essentially is, of course I could save you. It's not verbalized, of course I could save you. But what's the point? So once again, someone bails you out. Once again, someone, uh, someone you know, helps you out. No, no, you have to save yourself and you can do it too. And that's the point over here. What God has done is sending the ish. What God has done is give, is create an, a situation, an environment in which Yaakov can struggle, can wrestle and can demand the blessing directly, not indirectly, but demand the blessing directly. That's what Yaakov says. I have seen God face the Batinots, I, I have been saved. This was God's response. God's response was to allow Jacob an opportunity to save himself. The idea that the human being is capable, optimally, of saving oneself, of transforming oneself through a deep understanding, that is, I would say, central in terms of Jewish philosophy or philosophy that emerges from the Torah. I would say this is a central idea. You don't need someone else to save you. You're capable. People, people are capable of learning, of studying, of making decisions, which enables them to save themselves. Now we make one more point and I'll stop and take comments and questions. And if we have more time, I'll move to something else. And that is, who is this Ish over here? How do we understand the Ish? So the Ish is interesting because initially it's clear that this ish comes to destroy. This ish comes to prevent Jacob from crossing over, to prevent Jacob from realizing his, his destination. In order to become covenantal, he's got to cross the Mavar Yabo, I call it the, the river of struggle. But is he worthy? Nothing in his background suggests uh, that he is a particularly valiant and, and worthy person. But he's able somehow to, uh, and this ish wounds Jacob, injures Jacob. But the dawn is coming, and Jacob has wrestled, and Jacob is not vanquished. 
And suddenly, the Ish and Jacob demands the blessing directly. I want you to bless me directly. My blessing, not someone else's blessing. And suddenly, the J, this Ish becomes a different person. Suddenly, the Ish is no longer one who curses, but one who blesses. Of course, the sensitive reader of the Chumash understands immediately that this story over here is precisely parallel to the story in the book of Bamid or Bilam. It's exactly the same story and exactly the same question because the story of Bilam is the Torah's way of asking the question, is the second generation which grew up in the desert and they've also complained. Are they any more worthy than the first generation? To which the story of Bilam tells us, yes, they're worthy of blessing. And by the way, it's very interesting when you look at the Bilam uh, prophecies, eight on eight different occasions, Bilam has the expression Yaakov Yisrael. Eight times. In each of the four prophecies, the blessings, it's Yaakov and Yisrael. It is true we have biblical parallelism, but eight times is significant. And it's the same story over here. Jacob, who remains Jacob, will not be covenantal. But Jacob has this great ability to remake himself, to reinterpret himself in his past. He can say about Lavan in Lavan Garti, that wasn't my place. He learns from his errors, he learns from his experience. And then suddenly this ish becomes something else. The ish is a mirror. The ish is a reflection of who Jacob is. So I mention this because what's interesting is that in this story, if what I'm suggesting has merit, that actually within Jacob himself, he remains Jacob. Within Jacob himself, there coexist simultaneously both of the Jacob who's Yaakov. There's a piece of Jacob that doesn't change. There's a piece of Jacob that is snake-like. And then there's the other piece, which is Yisrael, which is the dominant piece. So it sounds like that other piece is always there, but Yisrael, Yashar, is a way of saying that these things, the, the, the nachash is not simply something external to human uh, character. It's part of human character, but it's a part of human character that we can, I would say, overcome, or perhaps better is to, to channel it in a different way. Perhaps that's the idea of the nachash and the It's striking that the, cure, the, the curative power of the nachash is striking. The nachash is there. People said, remove the snake. They don't, God did not remove the snake, but God teaches us a way to, to, to address that quality that is, that is within all of us. And over here, it's very striking that this ish, that what the ish represents in the story is, he's simply a mirror. He's reflecting what Yaakov actually is. Yaakov is both Yaakov, always will be Yaakov, but he's basically Israel. He's able to overcome Kisarito and Elohim, Bianoshim Vatuchal. And this struggle, says the Torah in the next verses, this struggle in the next two verses, keep going down. Yeah, yes, keep going down. It says, Hashemesh Kasher Pnuel Al First it says that when Jacob, the sun did rise, and Jacob was limping. So In other words, this event which takes place at night, this mysterious event, is one, says the Chumash, that Jacob's, Jacob carries with him. I wonder actually if beyond, you know, we have dreams, we wake up in the morning, we forget our dreams. But this is a dream, if it is a dream, that Jacob does not forget. Whether it actually happens or not is not important for us. What's important is this experience he carries with him. And actually, Soleya al Yerecho is very interesting because we remember in the story of the Garden of Eden, after God creates the Adam in chapter two in second creation narrative, God said, Lo tov adam It's not good for the person to be alone, the Adam to be alone. As Selo Ezer Kinegdo, I will make for him a helpmate. And 
God brings all the animals. That's not satisfactory. And then it says God took achat mitzarotav, one of the sides of the human, of the Adam, and fashioned another human being. So over here, the story over here, how does it begin? Jacob was left alone. In this case, though, the Acer Kinegdo is not something outside the human. In this case, the Tzolea al Yerecho, the reminder of his own vulnerabilities, which in turn recalls the struggle and the ability of Jacob to prevail, that comes from within Yaakov. It's not something external to Yaakov. That's verse number 32. And in verse 33, it says something else. Therefore, B'nai Yisrael, which could refer to Jacob's sons, or it could refer to the people of Israel. It sounds like it refers to us. To B'nai Yisrael, we don't eat the sinew of the thigh, even to this very day. For Jacob's hip socket was wrenched at the thigh muscle. That means this is an event that we carry with us. This is an event that we recall. And how do we recall it? In this case, we recall it by abstaining from eating the Gid HaMashek. The way we recall, the, one of the functions of ritual is to allow us to keep in mind constantly the great moments. There aren't that many great moments. But the, one of the purposes of ritual is to keep those moments alive. Says the Chumash, this moment is kept alive both by Jacob himself and by Israel, by Jacob himself, because it affects him his entire life. Even after the sun has risen. And beyond that, this is an event, says the Torah, that the people of Israel, B'nai Israel, keep in mind at all times. Our vulnerabilities, our weaknesses, uh, weakness which is inherent to being human, and then the ability of human beings somehow to wrestle, to struggle, and often injured in the struggle, wounded in the struggle, but to prevail. So here we have, I think, a very beautiful example of how the Nachash story plays out in what I think is one of the, if not the most significant narrative in the book of Genesis. Um, let me take some comments and questions now. Let me see, we have uh, about eight minutes left. Let me take comments and questions. Um, please speak up or in the chat. And then I just wanted to end with a thought, uh, one other thought about this. And maybe in the spring we'll continue. There's so much more here. Amalek, the Megillah, this plays out in many different texts. Okay, does anybody want to speak up? Please do. Sandra, you've had your hand up for eons. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, uh, Rabbi Silber, um, as you're telling the story and recalling the story of, um, of the uh, the deception and, and the taking of the bracha. Um, so what came back to me, uh, probably because um, you were you were you were telling the story again and again to us, is Isaac says um, he fears he's going to die. So we have Mavit and Lamut. That's that's yes. basically the death knell. The death knell uh, is primary there, and it's almost the motivator. Rebecca hears it, she motivates uh, Jacob. Everything starts to move very fast once he says the word Lamut. So his awareness of his death. Okay, then we have here, um, uh, we have the story of Asa where he says, uh, of course it preceded it, where he says, I'm about to die, what do I need the, right. the power for? So we have death again, um, sitting on your shoulder. One man is the father is very concerned about it. Um, the son Vayivez, you know, he's he's scorning the whole thing. Okay, and so it go, it does hark back to Eden because the whole point of the Nachash was he was testing Eve. He was pushing her against the tree, says the midrash. And, we, and like you have always taught us, always ask why the midrash says that. And he's pushing her and pushing her because do you die, the mavet or the. Uh, or the non-dying ability, the invincibility versus the death of the of the human living side by side with God in Eden is the motivating, maybe it's the motivating jealousy or one of the one of the animating forces that we talked about over the last week or two. So I think that the, the Mavet, the theme of Mavet, um, has to be hugely significant. Um Aesop scorns it, Yitzchak is 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 terrified of it and and feels 
he must move along and it animates Rebecca. And then this whole system of, of deception is cascading from it. So I just wanted to point out that that's another Nachash connection. Right, I think that the truth is that the Aesop's a- response, Aesop's thinking about Anochi Mut and Yitzchok's are actually very different because for Aesop, it's about what's the point of the future altogether? Everybody's limited in time, so you live in the moment. What happens afterwards is not relevant because I'm gone. For Yitzchok, it's I think the opposite. For Yitzchok, because I may die, and he lives much longer, but he's afraid he's gonna die, we have to secure the future. That's a very different. It's securing the future, um, despite our, the fact that we are limited, we're all limited, but we're thinking about looking into the future about, and, and that's what the covenant actually is. The covenant's about, and that's what Yaakov's, why Yaakov is the hero of the book, because Yaakov is one who, despite his difficult life, and it is difficult, he always has his eye on the future, on the, on the covenant, which, has, which is about the future. And Esav is the opposite. Esav is, because of his own finitude, all he thinks about is the moments. What do I care about the future, he says. Now, but the Nahash, the fact that the Yaakov Nahash took is the, crouching uh, at both places, it seems to me. And, and that's what well, we're- it's at. certainly similar, and that would again mm-hmm. reinforce the fact why he still likes Esav so much. Mm-hmm. He likes mm-hmm. Esav because they're very similar in a certain way. They both are connected to the land, for example, the field, and Yisrael says it. Uh, mm-hmm. So that is, they have a lot in common, but I do think there's a distinction there. Thank Does you. Anybody else have something to say? Anybody else? Yes, Noah. I had one small comment that when Jacob says, um, Batinatzel Nafshi. Yes. Safaria translated, it saved my life, but it also means it saved my soul, which well, might be- Well, Nafshi actually, in the, in, the, in the Bible, but that's a good question, what Nefesh means. Nefesh means a life. We say it doesn't also souls. mean soul? Not really. I mean, it comes to mean that, but Nefesh in the Torah mm-hmm. means people. We went down to Egypt with 70, we say in English also 70 souls, you know what I mean? We mean 70 mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. So again, the, the history of the word nefesh, what it means in different contexts is a very good question. But the plain meaning is person, human being is called a nefesh. Except right? that his soul is saved in a way. Whose soul is saved? Jacob's. Of course it's saved, that's my point. He saved his own soul. Yes. But, but what God I mean did. is, so even if it's not what it meant, it, it's true that his soul was saved as well. Well, as true. His I mean, it's right. It's, you might say it's true in the sense saving his soul, saving yes. his character, saving his, making him worthy of blessing. Yes. That, of course, is true. I think that, by the way, I find the story particularly, I mean, many people do. I find the story of Jacob, and there's more here, but I find the story particularly powerful. Because when I think about, look, basically I'm a, not basically, I am a, uh, a uh, teacher, that's what I do. Do some other stuff too, but basically teacher is the main thing. And I think that the goal actually, what I like to believe, and I do a lot of talking, but I think what I like to believe is a contribution and that Trisha has made, I think in general, is to create a space where people can, people can learn, people can think about the text, people can make contributions and to create a space which allows people to flourish, which allows people to learn, which allows all of us to examine the text. That's, that's the goal I think of, of, of teaching. And that's what God has done for Yaakov, the great chesed. Mm-hmm. Of course I could bail you out, says God. Of course I could save you. Just like you, you took Lovin's stuff and you, and you, and you, and you, and you Take Esau's bracha, of course I could do that. But what's the point? How's it gonna move you forward? No, I'm not gonna save you this time, but you know what? I'll create an environment for you, a setting, a difficult one, but a setting where you can struggle, you can, you, you can prevail. You can, you can say about yourself, mm-hmm. I've seen God face to face. That is, God provide me this opportunity, but it's my struggle. And yes, I am wounded, but at the end of the day, with all the struggle and with all the, the hurt, mm-hmm. I have prevailed. Um, I did want to um, I did want to add one point, and then I'll take a look, someone make the last comment about the ish. 
in chapter 30, 32. This ish actually appears later in the book of Breshit. Whether it's the same ish or a different ish, it's an ish. And in that story, the ish actually wins. In the story over here, Jacob prevails. But the ish later on, the ish prevails. And the story I'm referring to is when Joseph is sent by his father to find his brothers. Go and find the brothers and bring, and, and bring me back word of peace, see how they're doing. And Yosef sets out in chapter 37, but he gets lost on the way. He doesn't get there in time. Your brothers are in Shechem, city of brotherly love. But by the time he gets there, uh, the brothers have left. And by him saying, Ish, Ish, an Ish found him. And Ish finds him and says, Joseph says, he says, what are you looking for? My brothers, they've left Shechem. They've gone to Dotan, which means quarrel or trouble. And this Ish sends Joseph, as it were, to his almost death, but to his exile. And what's interesting is that in the case of Jacob, of course, where Jacob prevails, we mark Jacob's prevailing, says the Torah, we, B'nai Israel, by refraining from eating the Gid HaNoshev. The Gid Noshev means moved from its place. So the Gid HaNoshev represents that Jacob was wounded. The hip socket was Bateka Kaf Yerech Yaakov, moved from its place. But despite the suffering, despite the wound, Jacob survives and Jacob enters the land. In the case of Joseph, of course, the Ish sends Joseph out of the land. He ends up in Mitzrayim. And what represents the fact that Joseph has fully settled in the land of Egypt, having forgotten temporarily his past? Of course, he says it straight up. He names his first son Menashe. He nashani ohim at Amalivi at Kobe Tavi. God has enabled me to forget my past. When Menashe means to forget my father's house, to forget the land of Canaan, to, to forget my heritage. That's Menashe. So the Ish is a worthy adversary. In the case of Jacob, it's about overcoming. In the case of Joseph, he's not able to overcome in that story. And maybe part of it has to do with the larger context of the two stories. Because in the story of and this takes us back to the snake. The story of Jacob's overcoming the Ish, the larger context of Jacob's overcoming the Ish, is Jacob's ability to make peace with his brother. He does make peace with Esau. Now, if we had more time, I'd go much more deeply into it. But at the end of the day, at least in this next chapter, he makes peace with his brother. He says, forgive me, I sinned, I see you, take my gift, etc., etc." Then he goes his own path. He doesn't join with Esau. But he achieved some kind of atonement, a chapra pano. The story of Joseph, of course, in chapter 37, the larger context is Joseph's inability to make peace with his brothers. So maybe we should say the brother's inability to make peace with Joseph. So he ends up in the land of Egypt. The, 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 the family is split in two. And in the case of Joseph and the brothers, you can't simply have peaceful coexistence. No, because Jacob's dream was to build the house to build the inclusive structure. So Joseph and the brothers have to reunite. That's the story of Joseph. But I simply point out that the Ish figures in these two stories. In the first incident, it's all about Gihanosha. The sinew of the thigh moved from its place, which represents ability to prevail. And the larger context is the ability of people to work together. Story of the Garden of Eden, it's not just about leaving the Garden of Eden. It's a, the question, can human beings work together or not? In that particular case, it's Adam and, and, and Isha, Isha and Isha. It's uh, Adam and Chava. The very next story is Cain and Hevel. So the question the Torah has raised in so many different ways has to do with not just the abandonment of Eden, but the question is, can we prevail not only in terms of the covenant, but can we prevail in terms of dealing with 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 with, uh, with the other, those that we don't like, those that we have a history with, etc.? It's not a simple matter. Yaakov's great success is he's able to overcome, not only overcome uh, this ish, but he's able to figure out a way to make peace with his brother Esau, to do the right thing by Esau, to request forgiveness, and that allows Jacob to re-enter the land. In the story of Joseph in chapter 37, at that point at least, at that point in the narrative, 
The brothers and Joseph cannot reconcile. Joseph gets there too late. And whose fault is it? Everybody's fault. It's Joseph's fault. It's Jacob's fault. It's the brother's fault. He gets there too late, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's in the Yosef story. If they're going to be uh, covenantal, they have to figure out a way to make peace with each other, which they will do by the end of the book. But it's not a simple matter. So I think I'll stop at this point. Um, there's a lot more here, obviously. Um, I did want to give a shout out to Gitty Bentheim because in, I, we were discussing giving an additional class before Thanksgiving and uh, she came up with this topic and I, we both liked it very much. So I, what the heck, let's, let's go for it. So we had these four sessions. I hope you found them interesting and more importantly, a lot of food for thought. There's so much more here. Maybe we'll pick up with this again in the spring. Anyway, uh, thank you all. And uh, anybody has, wants to email me with questions, it's dsilver at trisha.org. Uh, Noah, did you want to add something? Yes. So first of all, thank you, as always, Rabbi Silver, uh, especially you know considering that this class was uh, put together on such short notice. And thank you to everyone here for mm -hmm. participating in our learning community. It's always enriching. And uh, we do have more classes ongoing, more classes starting soon. And in particular, I do want to call your attention to the fact that on Sunday, God willing, we're very fortunate to be having the Renee and Alexander Bohm Memorial Lecture on the topic, Does Jewish Law Recognize Righteousness? Given by Dr. B. Novick, I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope to see many, any, all of you there. Uh, you can learn more and sign up at the links that I just popped into the chat. And again, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Be well.